We've talked before about things that were happening in Africa during the First World War, about South America, events in North America, Australia, and the Middle East. And today, I'm going to look further east to China. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about what was happening in China during World War I. The 20 years before the war saw some big changes in China. Humiliating defeats against the Japanese in 1895 and the Boxer Rebellion in 1900 and the failure of the self-strengthening movement showed that the Qing Dynasty, after over two centuries of rule, was near to collapse. That collapse came with the Xinhai Revolution in 1911 that ended millennia of imperial rule and established the Republic of China. However, the six-year-old emperor retained his title and was treated like a foreign monarch, and many, even most, government officials and military leaders remained in office under the new republic. And there was still strong imperial sentiment among the elite. Power soon centralized around Yuan Shikai and his gang of military commanders and politicians, who would become known as the Beiyang Warlords. He was the only strong man left on the imperial side after the revolution, and knowing that he couldn't suppress revolutionary sentiment, he negotiated with the revolutionaries. And eventually, Sun Yat-sen, the revolutionary leader and first provisional president, abdicated in favor of Yuan, who was sworn in as second provisional president, March 10, 1912. Provisional President Yuan, however, did not share democratic ideals, and his presidency soon became an autocracy. After the 1913 assembly elections, the leader of Yuan's opposition was assassinated. Yuan dropped the provisional from his title. The National Assembly was forcibly dissolved, and in 1914, Yuan replaced the new constitution with a compact that basically gave him unlimited executive power. He was still unsatisfied, though, and made plans to become a new emperor of China. And at this time in Europe, the war broke out. Now, China declared neutrality on August 6, 1914, but there were many Chinese politicians who believed that by participating in the war, they could boost Chinese prestige in the global community. But they had other stuff to deal with right away. Japan took advantage of the Western powers being distracted by the war to expand its influence in China. And after the Battle of Qingdao, which happened shortly after the war began, when China demanded that the Allies remove all troops from Chinese soil, Japan refused. In January 1915, Japan sent 21 demands to Yuan that would extend Japanese control over China. And in exchange for submission, Japan would support Yuan's plans for becoming emperor. They negotiated throughout the spring, and by May, Yuan had accepted most of the demands. When this went public, though, it was met with anti-Yuan and anti-Japanese protests and a boycott of Japanese goods. Under British and American pressure, Japan dropped its harshest demands. In November 1915, Britain, Russia, and France urged China to join them in the war, but Yuan declined, though for months he had been negotiating in secret to send a Chinese labor force to Europe. In December, a special national representative assembly met and unanimously voted to restore the imperial throne with Yuan on it, and the new Chinese empire would come into being January 1st, 1916. Despite Yuan's best efforts to manipulate public opinion, the nation was against imperial restoration. The Beiyang warlords dissolved, and Japan began to favor the Republicans after seeing popular opinion so strongly against Yuan. On December 25, 1915, Yunnan province even declared its independence, which launched the National Protection War, and Yuan would abdicate his throne March 22. His reign as emperor lasted 83 days. He would die just months later in June. The end of the restoration farce led to more chaos in China, and Yuan's death created a big power vacuum. The former Beiyang warlords broke up into several cliques. In central China, it was two main factions, the Anhui and the Zhili. In the northeast and Manchuria, they combined with local warlords to form the Fengxian clique, and most of the non-Beiyang military leaders formed their own cliques across the country, and the warlord era began. The president was the weak and armyless Li Yuanhang, but the leaders of the Anhui and Zhili cliques were vice president and head of the state council, so a power struggle broke out, and the war, which had been largely ignored in general, became a hot issue. 
China had pretty much been pro-allies even while neutral, since they had more imperial interest and influence than the central powers. And now, Liang Shi, former minister of railways during imperial times, was successful in selling Chinese workers to France and Britain, both of whom experienced manpower shortages by this stage of the war. And the first contingent of what would become known as the Chinese Labor Corps set sail for Europe in July 1916 under the pretext of being a non-government funded commercial enterprise. In all, around 140,000 Chinese worked for the French and British by the end of the war. These men were tasked with work supporting frontline troops, unloading ships, repairing roads, building dugouts, even digging trenches and working in armament factories. In many cases, because of the prejudice of the day, they were treated very poorly, and many became ill from the strange climate and unusual diet. They did not take part in combat, and between 10 and 20,000 of them died during the course of the war, from shelling, landmines, illness, but mostly from the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918. Now, the U.S. broke off diplomatic relations with Germany February 3, 1917, and called for other neutral nations, like China, to do so as well. This China did on March 14th, but would China actively join the war? The Anhui pushed for the war, the Zhili urged restraint, and Japanese involvement and the February Russian Revolution further complicated the situation. Tensions rose everywhere, there were mobs in the street, and by May, the prospect of another revolution loomed large. At this time, President Li made the unfortunate decision to call Zhang Chun to Beijing as a mediator. Zhang, a warlord, was the leader of the 5,000-strong Pigtail Army and was a secret Qing loyalist, so he marched in with his army and put the child emperor back on the throne for 12 days until he was defeated by the Anhui Republican Army and its leader, Duan Chuori. Zhang had dissolved the Congress. Li refused to return to his post as president, so Duan had temporary control of the central government. And so, on August 14th, 1917, China declared war on Germany and Austria-Hungary. The situation got more complicated soon after because of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. The new Soviet Union alienated its allies by pursuing a separate peace with the Central Powers and leaving the war. And Japan offered a military alliance with China to prevent any possible Soviet threats. On May 16, 1918, the Sino-Japanese Army Agreement of Joint Defense Against Enemy was signed. After that, Japan began supporting Duan, now head of the War Participation Office, with equipment and funds to create a new elite army, and the Chinese government allowed Japan to extend its military presence in China, especially in Manchuria. Now, Duan did set up that army, and they were loyal to him and the Anhui, he was a warlord, but that didn't happen until 1919, after the Great War was over. If you're wondering, that army was eventually destroyed in the anhui Zhili War of 1920. Are you thoroughly confused by now? Well, you should be, because it was an amazingly complicated situation that I've only just scratched the surface of. But here's something for you to take away with you. The biggest effect of World War I on China was perhaps not political or military, but social. The May the 4th movement, comprising mainly young students, began in May 1919 as a popular protest against the treatment of China under the Treaty of Versailles. This movement is often regarded as a significant intellectual turning point for the nation and is credited with having a very strong effect on the birth of the Chinese Communist Party. Let's also not forget 140,000 Chinese were pretty much directly involved with the war as the Chinese Labor Corps on the Western Front. If you want to find out more about a fascinating story that took place in the Asian theater of World War I, you can click here for our special episode about the SMS Emden and her incredible voyage. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.